um, this morning in Sunday school and then in the morning service I'd like to finish this this thought but um, beginning in verse 51 I'd like to take Luke 9 verses 51 through 56 and start talking about something that I will finish in the morning service. Tonight, um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, James. Um, if God leads me back, I'd like to go, on Sunday nights, I'd like to go through James with you. It, uh, what a blessing. And we're, we're if, uh, Lord willing, if we go through James, we're going to do it with this thinking every Sunday night. We need to continually grow in Christ. It's called growing up in God's family. And I don't care how old you are in Christ. Um, in fact, in three years, I have been saved 60 years. And, um, you know, the, you know what the danger is of me being raised in a Christian home, uh, being saved early, called at 12 in a Christian camp, going off to Bible college, and being in ministry now 42 years, married 42. I just celebrated 42 years in May. All right, amen, yeah. Anymore, that's like, when you tell college students how old you are and then how long you're married, they all go, whoa. And I'm thinking, I'm not that old. I haven't been married that long, have I? But um, you know the tendency in, in, in all of us is to think we've arrived or we're a lot closer to arriving than maybe, you know, that lady over there or that fellow over there. I'd like to show you how James has been a conviction in my life. And so we'll start that tonight. Now look, if I don't do well today, let me know. I'll find something else to do in August. But right now, I'm praying, selfishly to be honest, that God would bring um, this older fella and bring him into the church family. They need someone like him at this stage in their life as a church to, I help, I think, to encourage them and move them forward. Uh, my first Sunday back in March, there was a lady there, her, ironically, her last name is Young, Louise Young, and she turned 100 in January. Now, before when I was there, she was in her 90s, and she promised to invite me to her party. Well, when I got there in March, I said, Miss, Miss Young, you turned 100, and you didn't invite me to your party. And she kind of giggled, and she always sits up front in the second row. And she said, well, preacher, I apologize, but I'm going to start praying you turn 100. Now, no one's ever done that to me. <laughs> so I, don't, I didn't know where to th whether to thank her, but um, she's been in the hospital uh, she, about a month ago during fellowship time in the service. She walked to the back, which she shouldn't have done, and she fell. Broke six ribs, punctured her lung. All she did was fall. So she just got home this week, and I'm telling you, she is a soul winner. I've never seen a lady like her, but uh, her name's Young. I always get a kick out of that. Brother Hallman, we're praying we'll be back next Sunday, just for even if it's for one service. Um, and then the uh, gentleman in the church from California, where I'm from, his wife died my second week there. Um, He's very faithful, has a walker. He was a highway patrolman and became a pastor in California, so Brother Cawthorn. And then they had a couple other people die. Uh, now, don't do that to me, okay? Everybody hang around, at least while I'm here for a little bit, because I enjoy ministering to you guys. But that's why every church needs a pastor for many reasons. One is to give security to the faithful older people who've really dedicated themselves to Christ and they need a pastor. Um, years ago, the Lord led me to this. I was reading through Luke for my own quiet time. And I ran into this verse, verse 51. And God really convicted me of it because as I kept reading the rest of the chapter, I realized there's a reason God wrote verse 51 the way he did. Let's read Luke 9, verse 51. came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Let me ask you guys, what do you think it means? This is a Sunday school class. What do you think it means when the Bible says, 
it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. What does that mean to you? All right. The process of doing what he came to do. Um, later, and by the way, from this verse on, if you go through Luke, and there's a lot of Luke left, he will. He is literally on his way to Jerusalem to be beaten, crucified, buried, and rise again. Okay, But on this day, the Bible says, our Lord set his face. The word set there means to make stable, to make firm, to render constant. On this day, uh, not that he didn't, have the same passion before this, but on this day, he was determined to lead his, his apostles, his disciples, to Jerusalem. It's going to take several months. I think the reason the Holy Spirit had Luke write that verse is because the rest of that day for our Lord, in my opinion, was kind of a bummer. It, you're going to meet three other kinds of people. Three, okay? We're going to look at his disciples, the chosen twelve. How they misunderstood what Jesus was doing in his own life. See, our Lord, would you agree from that verse, Jesus was completely surrendered to the will of God, the will of his Father. But he will then meet three different peoples, and they have very much different responses to be, being surrendered to the Father. This morning we'll look at the apostles, the twelve chosen disciples. And you know, because they, they needed to be corrected, not being completely surrendered to our Lord and our Heavenly Father can cause a problem in our life. I have struggled with this problem. You say, well, aren't you surrendered? Look, every born-again person, including everyone in this room, needs to be surrendered every day. And if you're not like the apostles in this first passage, then you might find yourself being like the three different people, the three different men that came to Jesus during the day and said, oh, hey, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, no, you won't because of this. And those three excuses are the excuses I believe most people that call themselves Christians suffer from today. I certainly see it in Bible college students. I plan on probably preaching this message sometime this year to the students because I haven't preached it for many, many years. Um, and it's not that students in the Bible college are the only ones to struggle with this. All Christians do. And then we'll look at the fourth group very quickly. Very quickly. Now we'll do part one this morning. Then we'll do the second and uh, actually three-point part in the morning service. So the whole idea is how surrendered are we? Do you know we, if I were to go to every person that's joined uh, this church, Eastside Baptist Church, Gospel Light, and say, do you have faith? I'm sure all of us would say, oh yeah, I have faith. But in the days we've been living in, just, just the COVID time, okay, we're out of COVID time, I think. <laughs> Who once I haven't heard the booster commercial bo booster shot commercials. I saw my first one the other day. Man, they were just plowing into us after we got through COVID. You need to get your booster. You need. Well, I ha then they stopped. Did you notice that? Then I saw my first one again. If you really love, you know, your children, knows you need to get booster. I'm not going to get involved in the politics of that. But we all understood one thing. Now we're learning about cover-ups and lies and manipulation. I heard, a st I read a statistic, Brother Coom, last week. They now estimate, Christian watchers claim that during COVID, um, well, 2020, before COVID and through COVID, that 40 million American people, a a professing Christians, stopped going to church. Stop. 40 million. They just stopped. Well, why... Why can we say, I have faith, but we're not faithful? Now, the word faithful, if you stop and take it apart, means full of faith. Yet you can meet these same Christians that say, oh, I believe I have faith, but they're not faithful. We really need to remind ourselves that Jesus Christ died for the local church, 
that the local church is still important to God and that those of us who believe we have faith must remain faithful and make church a priority. Amen, Brother Spencer. <laughs> because that's Bible. You say, well, you're talking to the choir. I know. Your faithful people are Sunday school people. I get that. But listen, don't you dare get discouraged. I don't get discouraged. I get perplexed sometimes. Then I read an article. I forgot to bring it. Written by a pastor. He said, we live in the age of, watch this, optionalism. It was, it's only two paragraphs, but man, he, he's an old 88-year-old fellow. It's a fundamental Baptist. He said, we now live in the, and he said, it's not just secular lost people, it's saved people. Optionalism means, hmm, if I feel like doing it, I will, but if I don't want to, I have the option. He said, unfortunately, that has entered our workplaces where you can go to fast food restaurants and you can't go in, they don't have workers. Or if you're sitting in a drive through for like 20 minutes, what is take? They don't have. The person at the window taking your money is the person that had to go fry the hamburger. People have just decided if I don't want to work, I won't work. And Christians, unfortunately, have decided if I don't want to read my Bible, I won't. It's my option. If I don't want to go to church, if I don't want to belong to a church, it's my option. Listen, he pointed out, you may want to argue that point, but there's one thing that's not an option. Yes, you have a choice, but if you do not choose to allow Jesus Christ to save you from your sin, it's not an option. You go to hell. Amen. And what I want to do while I'm back is to encourage the faithful people of this church. Yes, we need to pray. We need to get a pulpit committee. We need to look at, but the faithful people need to be just that, faithful. When I came the last time, I made the comment, if you really want a good pastor, then you need to prove to Christ you love this church. You know how you prove that and, and love him? You're faithful. Don't be an optional Christian. So I want to show you something that the Lord convicted me about because the disciples, the apostles, as they were living and doing the ministry, they had to learn a very difficult lesson that God's been teaching me. And that's about surrender. See, when we're not surrendered to the will of the Father, or in this case, even to Jesus Christ. Now, they, they I believe, saw our Lord being so determined, but somehow it didn't make the same impact in their life. And so they struggled. And I want to show you that when we try to live our Christian life um, without full surrender, it'll cause us to mismanage ministry. Now, every believer is in ministry. If you're saved today, God called you to ministry. We've got to get away from, sadly, the Roman Catholic Protestant idea that's infected our Baptist churches that only you know people like Brother Lucan, Brother Hanky, Brother Spencer, that we're in ministry, you guys are just lay people. That's not biblical. If you read the Bible, especially the New Testament, during the church age, the apostles talked to God's people as being in ministry. The ones that did ministry. Yes, they need pastors, teachers that they were given, according to Paul in Ephesians 4, as gifts to the local church. But we've been doing this the wrong way so long that many, I'd say most Christians think, well, um, you know, we, 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 uh, we, we do soul winning, that's the pastor's job. Uh, we hear Bible preaching, that's the pastor's job. Uh, the, the grounds, that's a deacon's job. No, all of us do ministry. And I want to show you what happens when you or I, we don't understand every day of our life, we should wake up surrendered to the will of our Father. Notice it says in the next verse, and uh, verse 52, and sent messengers uh, before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw them, this, uh, in other words, James and John, remember our brothers, they're called sons of Zebedee, or sons of thunder. They were hot-tempered. It wasn't just Peter. James and John, when they 
saw that the Samaritan people weren't even going to let Jesus pass through. They weren't going to recognize his Messiahship and his dignity. The Bible says, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we, I underline the word we, that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? You see, when we're not fully surrendered, we believers, and I'll be honest with you, no one is more guilty of this than preachers. No one. Surrender is not just for you, it's for me. It's for all of us that are saved. Because when we're not surrendered, and we're trying to do ministry, it can cause us to misuse what God wants us to do for Him. I want you to notice, uh, the Bible says they got angry. Did you know men, pastors, I'll just pick on pastors, all right, and evangelists. Do you know they get angry? It's, it's very easy to be angry. You say, why? Why would they get angry? Well, um, they try to pastor you and me. Listen, we're not easy to watch over. Do you know that? Now, we're called... There's a number of animals that are mentioned in the Bible about believers, but the main one is sheep. And I've already, we've already talked about that. You know, the pictures, you have one out in the hall still, right? They look white and fluffy and peaceful, but sheep are the second dumbest animal, I'm told. Okay? They can pass diseases, and you know they can drown easily? They're totally uh, vulnerable. They can't fight off enemy. The Lord said we're sheep. And sometimes it's easy to get angry. These men did. But notice they, their anger got vengeful. Did you see what they said to Jesus? Lord, that is terrible the way they're treating you. But listen, I think tucked behind their anger about what they did to Jesus was anger about they're not following what we told them to do. They became vengeful. They focused on themselves and their emotions. Notice they would say it this way. Wilt thou that we... You know, Jesus could have settled it. No, but they said, no, Lord, no. We're in ministry. We're offended. Why don't we call down fire like Elias or Elijah did? Do you realize what would have happened if Jesus had agreed and said, go ahead, and they had called down fire on this Samaritan village, unnamed? What would have happened? Every man, woman, boy, and girl would have gone straight to hell. They would not have had the opportunity. And Jesus points that out. Notice his rebuke of them. He turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Jesus said, Listen, they don't want us to pass through. Let's move on. We'll go to another village. Notice this rebuke. And this is where God really jumped me. Notice he says, first of all, they were wrong about themselves. They must have thought, like sometimes we believers in um, Newberry County. This is Newberry County. Yeah. You try to reach out to lost people. You try to invite them to revival meetings, to church. You try to maybe to invite their children. And sometimes when you're just trying to be a kind person, Christian, they snap at you. They mock you. They make fun of you. Well, listen, if we're not careful, and at that very moment, if we're not surrendered to our Savior, we can think maybe what we think are righteous thoughts. One man... I was witnessing with, I was young, in my 30s, um, going with the associate pastor. He was in his, at that time, 70s, uh, which to me was very old. Brother Kuhn, I thought seven-year-olds when I was in my 30s were next to taking their last breath. I've learned better since then. Uh, and he, he, was a, he was said to be a great soul winner. I thought, well, I'll go with him. 
And uh, so I asked him, he said, sure. So we're out soul winning him. He, um, his style was just not like mine. He was very offensive. But I remember we went up to a house, this is in Florida, on Saturday morning, and a gentleman was bent over at the front of his truck trying to fix his engine. And you could tell he was in the middle of it. And so we walked up, and this associate pastor, famous soul winner, said, hello, I'm so-and-so, this is Joel Spencer, and he gave a spiel. And the man said, uh, he didn't even look up. He just, working on his engine, said, I'm not interested. Well, that didn't stop this older gentleman. And he said, well, we, uh, we understand you're busy. So are we. We're out. This warm morning, spending our time trying to tell people about Jesus Christ. Sir, don't you just have a minute? And the man kind of looked up. He, he had grease all over him. He said, listen, I'm not interested. I'm busy. And so one more time, this associate passed. He went back down into his engine. Now, by this time, I'm torn because I'm thinking, okay, I know I'm 35 years old, but this man is not interested. We should move on. That wasn't good enough for this gentleman. And so he said, now listen, are you going to stop and have respect for me? I'm a man in the ministry to talk to you about Jesus. Well, the man this time lifted up with a wrench in his hand and said, I told you, get off my property. And so I'm embarrassed. I really am. I wanted to lay a track on the, you know, the fender of his truck and thank him, move along. So I, I turned around and started walking away. And this associate pastor walked about five feet turned around and just yelled well then you can just go to hell then now I'm I'm a, well the man raised up and do you know he wasn't angry he was shocked that a so called preacher two men would come and say that I remember making eye contact with that gentleman and trying to say I'm sorry you know and we walked away my I was grieved the rest of that morning as we were knocking on doors. In fact, I told the associate pastor, listen, I'll take every door. I'll take this one. I didn't want him. You know, that spirit sometimes, if we're not careful, I've been as guilty as him. If we're not, even this morning, if we don't acknowledge, Lord, you're the master. I'm just your servant. If we don't have a surrendered spirit, it can cause us to be vengeful and angry. Jesus rebukes them three, th three ways and then we'll be done. First, he said, you don't know right now in front of God what he thinks of your spirit. That's what he says. You know not what manner of spirit you are of. Secondly, he said they were completely wrong about the ministry. He's saying you do realize the Son of Man, that's him. In fact, the number one title Jesus gave of himself. You go through the Gospels. Every time Jesus spoke, over 80 times Jesus referred to himself in the Gospels, particularly Luke, as the Son of Man. Now he, once in a while, very rarely would refer to himself as the Son of God. He did it in front of Jewish people, and especially the rabbis, when they heard him call himself, they said, you're calling yourself God. Most of the time, Jesus would say in front of his disciples, I, the Son of Man, I, the Son of Man, because that was his title trying to remind even the believers, yes, I'm God, but I humbled myself to walk in flesh and dwell among you. So he says, you need to recognize what your ministry is about. I'm not here, men. I'm not here to destroy people. I've come down here to save people's lives. What you're doing is taking the ministry that, that God's given you and trying to destroy life. That's not what we're here for. Do you get angry about things? I do. Boy, especially lately. The, the, our country is literally turning to communism. But you see, we have a higher calling than America. That's the souls of men and women. We should pray for our country. We should vote correctly. And by the way, we should speak up as American citizens while we have that liberty. But God didn't save us and leave us here to forget our main function, and that is to minister to lost people. 
But the third thing, and I'll close with this, is he points out to them in in verses uh, 55 and 56 that they were wrong about their master, the Son of God. You see, they, they, they completely misunderstood why God had given them ministry, but they also then, in, in asking him, look, we know you can do it, but we're so angry, let us call down fire, that's one of your powers, Lord, but let us have it, and, and Jesus said, you've forgotten who I am. You forgot the ministry I gave you, that it's to save men, not destroy men, and you're forgetting who I am. The whole reason I'm here is to save lives. We need to remember that. Especially when we get, we watch our society and we watch the LGP, LGBTQ, uh, TI plus. Uh, and it's easy sometimes to get, let our anger almost sound vengeful. But I want to remind all of us that the only way that will correct that thinking, it, it, listen, I'm just as guilty, is to be surrendered. Now later, this morning, I want to take the three men that came to him. They all said, oh, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. One man, he went to personally and said, you follow me. I I hear Christians do it all the time. I see Christians behave this way. And much to my shame, I don't want to just be a committed Christian. I want to be a surrendered Christian. A lot of people make verbal commitments to pastors and to deacons and to each other in church, but they don't follow through. I think one of the reasons is they're not surrendered. I'll read the definition later this morning between commitment and, and surrender. You might be surprised. It takes, it takes everything pastors have just to get people to show up on Sunday once. Boy, in my day, in the 70s and 80s, uh, faithfulness was not defined by did you go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It was more than that. Now, if you can get families to come or a person to come just one day a month or one day on one time on Sunday, they think they're faithful. I'm sorry. Now, I know the Bible doesn't say, you know, the early church had a Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. No, it just says they met every day. But it was more than just them meeting. They had a purpose in gathering. I think we've lost our purpose. We don't realize that among all the things we do together, one is fellowship. The fact that we pray for each other. If you don't pray for each other, who else will? The lost don't care. They wouldn't know what to ask for, who to ask anyway. So, again, Jesus points out to them that they were wrong about themselves. They had developed a vengeful, mean spirit. Number two, they were wrong about the ministry the Lord had been using them now for over two years. And he said, how in the world did you get to this place in your life? You want to you want to destroy these, these people that are lost? Oh, I know they didn't want me to come. But you're wrong about them. I watched... Um, uh, little Fox News. I told you before, I can't. I used to watch Fox News for like a half hour. I can't take much more than 10 minutes. Not that what they're, I just, but I happened to watch an interview by uh, one of the congressmen. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. The four-star Air Force General. Uh, he was asking them, why at the academy are you introducing these woke things to the and uh, it's a sharp looking he was young brother uh, four star and the, the congressman said sir I have your I have your policy here can you tell me what a cisgender and then in in the in the general said well the reason he said I didn't ask you that I said can you this is in your document that you're approving for the training of our academy, Air Force Academy people. Do you know, and he named, I think, three, one of these weird names, cisgender, and I'd not heard of them. And the general finally, he said, sir, you understand what I'm asking. I need an answer. And the general looked at him and said, no, sir, I don't know what they mean. He said, but it's in your written, you you approve this policy to be forced upon, and that's the point. A lot of people in America, even lost, are not happy about this wokeism. 
But they do it. And sometimes I think the devil has them do it just to get people like us so mad and so angry that we get confused and think, I'll tell you what we need to do. No, I'll tell you what we're here for. That's to be surrendered to our Savior. And remember, lost people do lost things. And we should never get vengeful. Well, the Lord come back. I'd like the Lord to come back. I used to hear old, older Christians, from the time I remember, they'd get up and cry and say, I just want Jesus to come back. And I'm going, what? I don't. I do now. <laughs> but you know, when the Lord comes back to take us in the air, do you know what's going to happen to the world? Do you know how many millions will die in, in just overnight? Billions by the time of the end of this tribulation. According to, I believe, Zechariah, Zechariah said only one out of ten Jews will survive on the planet. Folks, um, that's not what I want. But I find myself getting angry to the point where I'm guilty. And I have to remind myself, and believe me, God, God brings me right back in my mind to Luke 9. You don't realize what you become, Joel. Number two, you don't realize that I saved you and gave you a ministry. And by the way, that's true of every one of you in here. If you're saved, God wants you to serve Him. And number three, you've forgotten who I am. Joel, the whole reason I came was that I might save people's lives. Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen. Now, Brother um, Sheely... And Brother Coombe, uh, weren't you guys kind of saved around those revival meetings about the same time? Yeah, a couple years apart. Yep. So, well, Brother Sheely, Brother Coombe, they weren't LGBT, transgender. Nope. But they were going to slip right into hell as fast as any of them. And, you know, there, I'll, bet, I'll bet there are some born-again people in Newberry County that would have met an unsaved Sheely, an unsaved Coon, and go, man, those guys are so wicked. They, you ever hear that man's tongue? You ever see his eye? Well, you know what? He, he just, he needs to die and go to hell. I'm glad at eight, God didn't give up on me. That my mom just hounded me. And she made sure we were in church. And most of all, the Holy Ghost ran after me for two years. I'm glad God could have I could have died. You see the point is Jesus said in number three don't you forget why I came. And if you're going to follow me if you're going to call me Lord then do what I do. In other words Jesus who saw the wickedness. By the way, when he sent others to that Samaritan village, unnamed village to prepare, didn't he already know they were going to reject him? Yeah, he's God. But the, the, the surrendered reaction of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lesson today, who steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, was simply to tell his apostles after he rebuked them, Come on, fellas. We'll just go to the next village. You know, there's always going to be ministry. As long as you and I can walk and we breathe and we function, there's going to be ministry. There always will be lost people that you will find if you're just trying to pay it. If you just say, Lord, lead me to someone. By the way, when you say that, he will. It's probably going to be at the Walmart or at the gas station or a neighbor that you haven't talked to for almost a year May God help us to have a surrendered attitude toward them. Thank you, Lord, for this time, and thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to speak about this subject. You know how you rebuke my heart. As we continue to look at this chapter, Father, help us to see this next point. These three people that, Lord, were followers. They said they wanted to follow, but they had three areas. That, Father, sometimes we struggle with or too often. Help us, Lord, we pray. And Father, we do pray for Eastside Baptist Church and Gospelite Baptist Church this morning that you would give their faithful people a peace. And uh, Lord, please uh, help them and help us, we pray. For your glory only, we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.
Amen. Amen. God bless you.